So I'll give you it from my perspective of what I think we should investigate and and be concerned about. Mm -hmm. So my overall perspective is we should be doing the things that most advance human flourishing mm -hmm. and the livability of our climate, you know, its impact on our life is a has an effect on human flourishing, a, a huge one. And part of that, and I think the overwhelming part, is to what extent do we have like the you know machines and fuel to take the naturally dangerous climate and make it safe. So climate is naturally dangerous, but we also want to avoid increasing its natural danger level uh, if we can. So you can kind of think of it like a disease. You know, the first thing is if you have a disease that's rampant, you want to be able to cure the disease, but you, you want to avoid spreading the disease even more, making it, you might think with antibiotics is a good example. Like you want antibiotics to be able to deal with different kinds of uh, bacteria, but you also want to avoid making the bacteria worse, which is actually with antibiotics, mm -hmm. that's actually a real issue. And so what people are claiming with fossil fuels, which is at least worth investigating, is basically, they're not mentioning the, the, the good part of it, but from my perspective, they're saying, yes, fossil fuels have made us much safer from climate, but at the same time, tragically, they're making the climate more hostile. So I think that's the coherent version of the argument versus the, the, the incoherent conventional version of the argument is just fossil fuels took our perfect planet and ruined it and we hate them and blah, blah, blah. Like there's no coherent version of the argument that doesn't acknowledge the huge benefits of fossil fuels, including that fossil fuels have made climate much more livable. But then if, so if we, if we look at it in the context of fossil fuels have these benefits, but then the question is, do they, are they making the climate much more hostile? And then the mechanism of that is when you, when you burn fossil fuels to produce energy, they're called hydrocarbons. So they're made of hydrogen and carbon. And basically when you burn something, you're splitting it apart and then oxygen is attaching to each uh, atom. So you basically get water, water vapor. That's why with smokestacks, you see all this water vapor. And then you get uh, carbon dioxide that comes out. So the H becomes H2O, uh, water vapor, and the carbon becomes carbon dioxide, CO2. And by the way, if you want to understand why things like smog happen, it's because the fossil fuels ultimately come from plants, and plants ha don't just have carbon and hydrogen, they have things like nitrogen and sulfur. And so what happens is when you burn them, the oxygen will attach to the sulfur and become sulfur dioxide, and with enough of that, you get smog. And with the nitrogen, you can have different kinds of nitrous oxide. So it all comes from, you're taking these hydrocarbon plant things, and you're burning them. And so the reason we love them is because we get so much energy from them. But then there's, okay, there's this water vapor. People aren't too concerned about that. But then there's the CO2, which people are concerned about. And then there are these other byproducts, which people are historically concerned about. And, and you should be concerned about, like, all things be equal. You want to avoid smog. So let's just focus on CO2. Mm -hmm. So the idea of CO2 is CO2, when you isolate it in a laboratory, uh, is what they call an infrared absorber, although people often call it greenhouse gas, which is actually not a very good uh, term because they think of it as like, if you put glass on a greenhouse and it gets warmer inside, that's but that's not really what's happening. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so what's happening is it's um, certain molecules are good at absorbing a certain spectrum of light called infrared light. And so the short version of it, sun shines on the earth and then... Um, the energy that hits the earth will basically, like it could just theoretically could just hit the earth and bounce off. And then it would just be like when the sun was on, it would just bounce off and then otherwise it would just be freezing cold all the time when the sun wasn't shining. But we have this atmosphere and part of what the atmosphere does is it traps some of the heat and including in this infrared form. And so what this, what this greenhouse effect or infrared absorber effect does is the molecules in the atmosphere, what they basically do is they slow the exit of the energy from the sun. And so they, they maintain it longer. And so it like kind of drags out. And that's what, that's what makes it a lot warmer on our planet than it would otherwise be. And then what's happening is we, let's say in, in the year, so throughout history, we've had different levels of what are called these uh, greenhouse, I'll call them greenhouse gases, even though it's not quite the right way to think of them. We've had different levels of them. So for example, today we have a 0.04% or 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And historically estimates are we've had it at least 10 times that amount, maybe 20 times oh, really? that amount. Yeah. And then, yeah, people don't know this because nobody gives context. And those were, those were warmer periods. Um, 
in part because of the infrared heat trapping effect, but notably they were incredibly fertile periods. I mean, this is like when dinosaurs were around, you think about what kind of natural plant life like we can barely survive off natural plant life. Imagine dinosaurs, how are dinosaurs survive? Like these huge things, they have these massive plants. So you have these very fertile periods, but often warmer periods, although, so there's not a perfect correlation at all between these greenhouse gases and warmth, but we know that when we isolate them, they lead to more warmth because they trap a certain amount of heat, but then there are other things going on too that will make it warmer or colder over time. So basically in, the, you know, before we started adding CO2 to the atmosphere, it was about 0.03% of the atmosphere. And since we've started adding CO2, it's gone up to 0.04%. And people are concerned it'll go from, and it will if we keep using fossil fuels, to 0.05%, 0.06%, because it lasts a little while in the atmosphere, it doesn't just go out uh, immediately. So what we have is rising CO2 levels, and then the concern is that those of those, what they'll call heat trapping gases, uh, that that will increase temperature so that's kind of one thing is that the that the heat trapping gases will increase temperature and then that that temperature will not only be undesirable in and of itself for many people that will cause other climate changes such as rising sea levels which is probably uh the most dangerous theoretical one uh increased drought uh, and then associated other things that people talk about but so the, the key idea the, the place where there's agreement is that these are heat trapping gases. The places of big disagreement are how good are they at trapping heat? Basically, are they trapping heat to the point where it's gonna get a lot warmer by going from 0.03% to 0.04% or is it just gonna get a little bit warmer? Because it's still releasing, it's still releasing the atmosphere, but the, the idea is just not as fast. Well, it's it's the it's the energy that gets that goes. It's it's called an energy balance, but it's like it's not like it gets trapped. Nothing gets trapped permanently. Right. Energy is always coming in and going out. Life as we know it just means it the energy is slowed coming right. out, and so that's it's it's not like it's just stuck here forever because it ultimately di all uh, all dissipates. But it's it's uh just it's, takes it's, longer, and it's, it's in, while it takes longer, we're just sitting in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, people like. There are different analogies that people use, but I can't think of any, it, what it's, it's just kind of, but I mean, yeah, so it's, it's not like anything is permanently here, but yeah, the, as long as the CO2 level is here, basically it's, it's warmer, but it, part of the context is it's, we've had much higher CO, not we as humans, but other species have had much higher CO2 levels. It's not like the earth just gets hotter and hotter and hotter and it burns. It's just a lower, higher average temperature. And so right now in the history of the earth, we're quite low in terms of CO2 levels from a historical perspective. And we're actually, like you start to get major plant death problems when you're at about half of our current level and um, two thirds of our previous level of like 0.03%. So once you get to 0.02%, you actually start running into a bunch of problems with plant life and then animal life depends on plant life. And then once you get below that, it's a big problem. And then, you know, we've had 20 times higher. So it's like, we, in terms of life on Earth, we've seen that it can thrive and, and flourish with much, much higher CO2 levels. So then the question should be, how does that affect human life? Because the, the coherent version of that, of the catastrophe argument, is not that the planet will, like, life will not be able to live. That makes no sense, given what we know about the history of the planet. The argument is that the rate of change is too fast and that we will not be able to adapt to it. So for instance, it's not like the sea levels be intrinsically so high, but that we already built cities at a certain level and that we won't be able to, to adapt to it. And it's not that, oh, it'll be intrinsically too hot everywhere, but oh, we moved to places and it's gonna be too hot in those places. But that depends on A, so there are really three things it depends on, if, if you believe in catastrophe. A, like a significant, like a rapid rise in temperature, B, significant increase in climate hostility, and C, human inability to cope with it. So those are the, like the three pieces of the catastrophe puzzle. But I mean, it's important, all of these are pretty strong. So they have to say rapid rise in temperatures, like significant increase in climate hostility, and then inability of us to deal with it. And so my, my basic focus is on part three, that our level of climate mastery enables us to deal with just about any kind of of climate change, and actually we already live, humanity already flourishes in every kind of climate imaginable today, like from swampy Florida 
um, to polar Alaska. And so my, my starting point, even before I look at the specifics of the science, is that it, it would take a lot for me to be, to, to, for a climate change to be on the top of my list of human flourishing priorities. Because on my list of human flourishing priorities is three billion people have virtually no energy, which means that they can't flourish in any kind of significant way. So for me, that's a catastrophe. Like human poverty, almost half the world living in an impoverished state, that's that's the end of the world. I mean, from my perspective, if I lived there, it'd be the end of the world for me. So I think of that's the end of the world for those people. So for me to for me to weigh it becoming warmer or more storms or sea levels changing or droughts, like for that to rise to the level of the importance of energy is very hard for me to imagine. And then when I look at, and what I notice when I look at the thought leaders on this issue is none of them at all acknowledge our level of climate mastery and they don't focus on it. So they, they don't focus on the need for energy in general. They don't put much weight on that. And they don't focus any weight on the need for energy to master climate uh, in particular. And what I notice, and my my um, argument is that just as they are biased in ignoring the positives of fossil fuels, both in general and for climate mastery, so they have a tendency to exaggerate the negatives. So I believe that we do have a warming influence, that it may cause some other things, although that's really don't know as much about that, um, but that it is far smaller than the catastrophists say. So it's certain if you, just someone watching this, if you look at the catastrophists, you can be certain just from listening to me and from common sense that they are almost totally ignoring the climate mastery piece of the puzzle and the fossil fuels and human flourishing piece of the puzzle. Like they're obviously biased about that. I think once you have this perspective, what you can't know from me directly is, am I right that they're exaggerating the, the negative significance of rising CO2 levels. Although even there, there are hints. For example, they don't tell you that they used to be much higher. They don't pay attention to the fact that there's a lot of global greening, because the more CO2 we have, the more greening we have. They don't pay attention- Greening meaning- uh... Sorry, more growth in plant life around the world. Like you have places that have been untouched by humans that are dramatically greener than they were before. And that's attributed to CO2. It also helps with crops a lot in general. So if, if you just know from grade school, CO2 tends to increase plant growth, and somebody tells you, if, if you just know CO, two facts about human history. One is that human beings are usually too cold and want it to be warmer. I'm always freezing. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, we have a running joke here. They, they turn the air on to like below 80, and I'm I freak out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even all, all humans, not just women who have a, a reputation <laughs> for being cold, right? But it's it's like human beings are generally, like they generally die, they generally have more problems with cold than heat. Like we die much more from cold than heat. So that's one thing. And two is that um, CO2 causes plant growth. So those are just two, those are just two kind of basic facts you know. And so when you hear rise in CO2 levels, one, and you don't know anything about fossil fuels, but you might think, hmm, well, aren't some human beings gonna benefit from it being warmer? And, um, and particularly once you learn the warming actually occurs nearer to the poles. So it's the people who are already cold who are going to warm more. It's not so much people in Arizona. So you learn that and then you learn, oh, that you might expect some people will like it being warm and there'll be more plant growth. And then you notice that everybody talking about the issue doesn't mention that at all. It's not that they say, yes, of course, many people, it'll be more pleasant and yes, we'll have this benefit of plant growth, but the disruption from the rate of change will be much worse and that'll outweigh that. They don't give you that context. They just act like we sinned against the climate gods. We put CO2 in the atmosphere. They usually make it black, right? They'll put like these black clouds, even though CO2 is in invisible. And then it's like the climate had a smiley face, right? And then it has a frowny face. Like that's the narrative. So it's it's very religious kind of narrative. It's like, we shouldn't be impacting climate. It's like the tablet said, thou shalt not impact climate. Then we impacted climate and therefore nature punished us. So it's it's this is the opposite of like a human flourishing cost benefit analysis because they're not looking at human flourishing in any kind of serious way. They're not looking at any potential benefits of CO2, let alone fossil fuels. They're only looking at negatives. And I think thus, if, if you can see how much of a distortion is going on there, it shouldn't be very far-fetched that they are exaggerating the negatives. And then particularly if, if you read chapter one of Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, it talks about what I call the secret history of fossil fuels. And it points out that many of the thought leaders on this issue today have a 30 plus year track record 
of arguing that we were already going to have a climate catastrophe. So the climate, when you hear, you know, 12 years remaining, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we were told that 12 years ago, 24 years ago, 36 years ago. So there's a whole track record of making these predictions. And that's another thing that you're not told. So if, if somebody makes a lot of bad predictions and they don't come true, they should own up to that. Even if they think they're right, they should own up to there's something wrong in my method that made me premature. And yet, if you look at today's thought leaders, there's no owning up to all the catastrophic predictions they've made. So what what I think this makes my theory even more plausible just to somebody watching. Obviously, they can decide for themselves. But my theory is that the framework of prioritizing minimal human impact over human flourishing and having this view that the planet is perfect versus and that we shouldn't touch it versus the planet is deficient, that it's that philosophical framework that's causing people to ignore the positives of fossil fuels for human flourishing and exaggerate the negatives. So that's <laughs> that's my explanation of, because people say like, how can you, 97% of scientists, like first of all, 97% of scientists did not say there's a climate catastrophe, or let alone even climate scientists, but the way lots of smart people can be wrong is they can have a framework for their thinking where either they have the wrong goal, and sometimes an unclear goal, they have wrong assumptions about how the world works, like the planet is this perfect garden of Eden, or they can have bad methodology, like they can be biased. And so if you have a goal of an untouched planet, if you have an assumption that an untouched planet is a garden of Eden, or if you have any kind of bias, particularly where you look at you look at so-called at technologies that impact the world a lot and you think that they're going to be bad, then you can look at a technology that is the most valuable technology in the history of civilization and you can be mad at it. And that's what's happened with fossil fuels. It's from a human flourishing perspective, it is the most valuable product in the history of civilization and yet people hate it. And they don't say, yes, it's the most valuable product of civilization, now I'm worried about it. There's just this huge hostility. Like, I mean, imagine somebody being grateful to the oil industry. Like, you don't see that. And it's not that, it would be one thing if they said, Oil industry, thank you for, the um, only reason I'm alive is because of what you, the oil industry, did. I can enjoy my life. I can be with my friends. I can do the work that I want. I can take time off. Like, thank you, oil. Like, you are some of the, I, I owe my life to you. But unfortunately, now we see either that, now we have better alternatives, if that were true. Unfortunately, it's not right now. But, or that there's a big problem that wasn't a problem before. Like today's CO2 level rise is going to be a bigger problem, much bigger problem than yesterday's. That's a coherent argument. It's not a coherent argument to say, fuck you, oil, and then and then and you're fucking up the world even more, which is basically what the culture says today. I, I don't I hope we didn't get screwed on uh the privacy the the profanity policy of youtube no 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 we're no we're we're we don't care about that <laughs> mature audiences <laughs> we're only. again screwed over either way it doesn't yeah. matter um so okay so so i guess to i guess to kind of wrap up what what do you think about the the future of this conversation because you know you've laid out your case for why fossil fuels are beneficial for human flourishing today yeah um what what do you think this means for the future if we are consuming fossil fuels like we are today? Well, I mean, my focus is to get people to think about the issue from a human flourishing based perspective so that we have the freedom to do it because we need the freedom ourselves. I mean, we in the wealthy world and then certainly people in the poor world mm -hmm. need the freedom to use fossil fuels. And that's, that's very much in jeopardy. I mean, you look at say the Paris climate accords, which is, which is a commitment now, it's not actually a binding commitment, but it's a commitment to say we should reduce emissions by 80 plus percent in the next 30 years. Now, if you see a graph of CO2 emissions, and if you compare it to a graph of life expectancy, if you compare it to a graph of income, and if you compare it to a graph of how many people are alive, which means how many people the planet can support in its current state, they all are all hockey sticks. So... No CO2 emissions, way up. Life expectancy is like 30, way up. Income is really low, way up. Number of people the planet can support, you know, like a billion or way up. So if you have those graphs, I call this the human flourishing hockey stick, and then and you see that, and then somebody says, with this thing that correlates, and then they say, boom. 
like they wanted to go down four fifths of the way. Mm -hmm. And then you know that even where we are today, only half the people in the world have that. So we want it to go up, you know, a bunch more. That's really scary. So people are, we still have massive energy scarcity in terms of human flourishing. And then people are saying the one major source of energy abundance, let's massively cut that off as our top priority. That's a terrifying thing. And it's it's more terrifying to me that this, this was regarded as morally incontrovertible by the world. So let's, let's, this is not a controversial, controversial statement that Donald Trump is a controversial president, mm -hmm. uh, who many people object to many policies of. And yet, even as much as people objected to in different ways, for many thought leaders, Trump withdrawing from the Paris Accords was the worst thing that mm -hmm. he had done in their eyes. You know, I remember one that, that hit me hard was Bob Iger who's the um, head of Disney and who is you know, a really good friend of Steve Jobs, who's an idol of mine as, as well as of, of many other people and seems like a, a great guy from what I can tell in like many ways. And I, I saw him tweet about it and I just said, like, I'm resigning from Trump's presidential business council or whatever it was. Like, I need to take a stand on principle. And I'm just thinking like, what are you, like your whole business is human flourishing, but particularly in terms of the emphasis on enjoying the abundance of time that's made possible by fossil-fueled civilization. Like I think of fossil fuels as they give us a longer life and then control of the time in our lives. And so we get to do the activities we want to do with the people we want to do them with and the places we want to do them. Like watching a Disney movie is an incredible luxury in like in a good sense. But he just, in his mind, the way he's been taught to think of it, he has no connection between that and fossil fuels. He just thinks of it as, yeah, of course we get energy and we we shouldn't be getting it from fossil fuels. We should be getting it from something else. But the real problem is CO2 has gone from 0.03% to 0.04%. Like, that's where I take a moral stand. It's like, no, why not take, like, what about the level of, I don't care about the level of CO2 nearly as much as I care about the level of human flourishing, the level of access to energy. And the point is that for a really smart, conscientious guy, this wasn't on his his mind even. So to me, that, sh and, and he's supporting what I believe is a murderous policy. That is, if this policy gets passed, you will be able to directly or indirectly, but probably pretty directly point to a lot of Venezuela type cases where you just see massive suffering and then a whole bunch more cases where they never industrialized because they were not, they didn't have the opportunity to in terms, because the poorest people need the most fossil fuels. You'll have just had this, this destruction and, but Bob Iger will have been part of it. And like, he seems like a nice guy. So to me, that shows that the thinking is, is still so bad that there's a lot of room. And so my own focus is I'm actually, at some point next year, the, the next version of Moral Case will come out. And, and for me, it's, I'm spending more time on the new version than the first version, because the first version in, influenced a lot of people. But my premise is it's much more true than influential. So I'm trying to figure out how do I, like if I explained it at a six level before, in terms of doing the issue justice, maybe I can do a nine. So that that's my own focus is just, I've looked at the arguments again, I've reviewed it, like I'm more convinced than ever uh, about the core of the argument. So then the only thing I can do think of to do is how to make it uh, better. And then in more places, which is part of the reason to come on shows like this. Gotcha. Well, I mean, Alex, is there anything else that, that you feel like we haven't covered that you want to get out there? I mean, I know you've been talking about that. You, you talk about this all, all the time. But um, yeah, is there is there? Yeah. Else? So one one topic that came yeah. up in the pre-show that might be, uh, I think I have an unusual perspective on. I guess I have an unusual perspective on, on a bunch of things. <laughs> but is uh, we were talking about business models in in the sphere of people with yes. uh, ideas, and often people ask me, "What's your business model?" In part because they have this idea that some, at least before they hear me explain my views, that 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 the product of me saying things like, I love fossil fuels, that that must have, that was a devious conspiracy by the oil industry. You know, mm -hmm. they, they sort of handpicked me and then gave me some gold-plated lifestyle as long as I was willing to sell my soul uh, for this for this kind of thing. So I mentioned, like, historically, I didn't even have any background in this. I didn't even know anyone in the industry. Uh, when I started coming to these ideas, I, I didn't know anyone uh, in the industry. But over the years, 
Uh, I have part of the way that I and I have a team of people at my company, the Center for Industrial Progress, one thing we deliberately set out was to work with the industry, but in a very different way than people conventionally do. So people conventionally work with industrialists uh, in a donor-recipient relationship, and that has a lot of benefits. But basically, they'll go to somebody and they'll say, hey, look, I'm fighting for your values in the world. Cut me uh, a check. You know, and that that has a lot of there's a lot of good things done that way. There's a lot of issues with that too. I was interested in 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 something different. What I was interested in is what I really wanted to happen was I wanted to see if I could get the companies to start teaching both their employees and the public the human flourishing case for what they do. So I wasn't interested primarily in in the money. For, I didn't want money for me to speak. I actually wanted them to pay me to tell them how to speak. So, you know, I didn't want to be like a mouthpiece, right? I wanted them to be the microphone, but, but a willing microphone. Because what, what I suspected is that there are a lot of people in that industry who know on some level that they're doing something good, but they don't have the words for it. They were never trained in these arguments. They haven't explored these issues. And so that that undercuts morale hugely like with the employee base. If you, you know, people working in an oil company who grew up with what I grew up with, I mean, I can't even imagine because meaning for work is just like, I've only ever wanted to do work that I, that I totally believed in to the point where I was willing to work as hard as I yeah, yeah, needed to work. Of, I feel like it's used as an insult to people now to be like, well, they were, you know, politicians or uh, lobbyists, whatever. Uh, well, they work for the oil company. Yeah, They're exactly. With the oil company. It sounds bad. It, it sounds, <laughs> if you don't know, you know. Well, like, it depends on how oil, so hopefully yeah. oil will sound different because of like, oh, wow, they work yeah. for the oil company. That would be good. But but uh, yeah, so my goal was to create um, a big part of our business where we basically helped with what they call the messaging of the industry. So that's basically the content that they deliver to their key audiences. So one is, what's the content that they deliver to their employees? What messages are they giving them? And the idea is, I want the employees to learn the moral case for fossil fuel. And so one thing I do is I'll go, I go speak a lot of places, but I'll definitely speak at oil companies too, or coal companies or, you know, gas companies. And I'll talk to the employees about this is what, how I came to the conclusion that what, even though I have I had nothing to do with it, this is how I on my own came to the conclusion that why what you do is good. And how the key to this is not, is, is, is like, it's not any particular fact, it's more the framework of looking at it from a human flourishing perspective. And so if you look at it from that perspective, then I think you'll have a lot more appreciation. And then the other thing is um, sometimes, although not a lot of times, Companies and I, I'll, I'll agree with them on policy. Unfortunately, a lot of times companies do what's called rent seeking, which is they'll ask for special favors for themselves. Like the oil guys will try to screw over the solar guys, or solar will try to screw over nuclear, etc. And so I'm pro freedom, so I don't want to get involved in that. But sometimes there are cases where I think it's just the oil companies are having their freedom taken away. And so what we decided to do is talk to the executives and say, hey, for this particular issue. Like, let's say I wasn't involved in this, but the example would be like, we didn't have the freedom to export oil for a while. And they, they fought for it and fortunately won it a couple of years ago. Like, we can help you make this case. Like, we can use the human flourishing approach to explain to people why exporting oil mm -hmm. is good for their lives. So, and this is something that's historically this kind of function of helping with messaging is historically done with PR firms. Mm -hmm. you know? But my view of that is, A, I never wanted to be a PR firm because I only want to advocate for things that I believe in. And B, my problem with the PR firms in this is they don't even usually believe that the companies are good. So if you, if they haven't even convinced themselves that you're good, how are they going to convince anyone else that you're good? So we, we've, um, yeah, my company, we've got a team of people. And part of what we do is we help companies that we agree with on messaging. And there's a lot more work to do there, just as there's a lot more work to do with the public. But I hope that other people in other industries get into this. I hope that people think of, if you have a generally positive view of industry and you have good arguments for them, maybe create a business model where you can give them the words they need when they need them to make the case for freedom, to make the case for their activities and and human flourishing. Don't just go ask them uh, for donations. I mean, that can be good too, but donations are, you know, my own personal experiences, if you have a really good business model, that 
gives you a lot of freedom. Like I have the freedom to spend an ungodly amount of time working on a book because uh, I have a business model, whereas I know a lot of people who have controversial views and they they have a donor-based model and they just always have to worry about the donor yanking out the funding. And like if they do something controversial, it's like in um, in uh, 2016, the, the attorney general of Massachusetts, uh, I think it was 2016, yeah, they had this case against Exxon where they're basically, the, the narrative was Exxon knew that climate change was catastrophic and they didn't tell anyone, which doesn't make any sense, A, because I don't believe it's catastrophic, but B, how can a private company have specialized knowledge of climate science? Like, it doesn't make any <laughs> sense. But but they they named me on the subpoena. Now, I mean, they, I, they said, Exxon, if you've ever had any communications with Alex Epstein, release all emails. So oh. uh, uh, I had uh, there was nothing I was afraid of at all, but I resented the idea that they are asking for alleged emails of me. So I, I emailed the attorney general and, and I uh, wrote the subject line was like your demand to seize my emails or something like that. And the text was fuck off fascist. And that was it. You wrote that? Yeah, I wrote that term. And then I publicized it on, <laughs> on Twitter and stuff. And that's the kind of thing where like one angry, you know, one angry donor, like they could just say, oh, I don't approve of that. That's not what my money was intended for. And it's just, it's really nice if you can have the freedom to think and, and say what you want. And I hope that we're talking in advance this. I hope that, you know, with the rise of Patreon and other things, I hope that there are like broader bases of supporters who give more people the freedom to really just act on their uh, their conviction. Right, right. Because we, 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 the whole thing came up because we were talking about um, this whole space that's happening with online shows, more independent, you know, producers and, you know, uh, productions like ours. Um, and just the different emerging forms of revenue. You know, there's the obvious ones like, you know, Patreon. Um, I think the more traditional, traditional like Kickstarter and all that. But then there's, you know, there's a lot of like other crypto options or browsers or, mm -hmm. or, or things like that. And so anyway, we just started talking about um, business models. So that that was interesting that uh, for you to... Yeah. Talk about yours. But so I, I happily take money, as they say. Like, I happily take money, but proudly, this is the point, like, proudly take money or charge money to the fossil fuel industry. And I hope that more people uh, emulate that. And I hope they, they should really question if they have a negative association in dealing with the industry. This is the industry that powers every other industry that mm -hmm. makes our lives possible. So a, having a negative association with fossil fuels is you should question. And then B, having a negative association with industry. Uh, you should question because fossil fuels and industry are essential to human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Alex, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, uh, talking about this. Uh, like I said, you're the first person to come on to talk about this. I'm sure we'll have many others with different perspectives, but I'm just happy to get the conversation started. Okay, awesome. Uh, Thanks for yeah, having me. Of course. We'll have to have you back when your new uh, version comes out. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.